Welcome to Talent Unfiltered. Located at the intersection of innovation and all things talent. Talent Unfiltered is presented by HireWorks. HireWorks, talent forward. Now, here is your host, Ron Godier. It is Monday, June 22nd, 2020. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Talent Unfiltered, presented by HireWorks. I am Ron Godier, coming to you from Chicago. You, on the other hand, are looking at St. Louis, Missouri, my not-so-humble hometown, and I will explain to you in just a couple of minutes uh, why you are looking at St. Louis today. For right now, I hope all of you are safe, sound, healthy, uh, I hope that all the dads out there had a great Father's Day uh, yesterday, even though I'm sure it was different than some that you remember uh, in the past. Uh, I hope that it was good nonetheless and that you and your families uh, had a great time. Now, as I said at the top, you were looking at St. Louis. Uh, the reason you were looking at it is because I was there on Monday, uh, Tuesday, and Wednesday of last week. Um, earlier this year, my father uh, passed away in February, uh, and because of COVID uh, and the pandemic, uh, we have not been able to have a memorial. We have not been able to have a funeral. And we haven't been able, able to really find closure in this uh, just yet. And this last week was the first opportunity uh, that we had to do that. And the reason I bring it up more so is because of the differences I noticed between St. Louis and here uh, with respect to the response to COVID. Um, here, we're still wearing masks. Uh, there aren't many people going in and out of the city on, uh, on the commuter rails. Um, downtown is still pretty empty, uh, even though there are some people beginning to come back uh, a little bit at a time. Uh, down in St. Louis, went out to dinner with family on Tuesday night, no social distancing. Nobody was wearing masks except a couple of people uh, from the wait staff. And, and I bring this up because um, we are noticing a spike in cases uh, in those states, particularly that opened up early uh, and very, very quickly. Florida, for example, uh, had its highest number of cases throughout the entire pandemic just last week. Um, now, some of that they say can be attributable to more testing. Okay, uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you that. Uh, but it still is cause for concern. And I bring this up because no matter where you are, no matter where you're watching uh, this at, uh, COVID-19 is still a threat. So let's do the responsible things. Let's make sure we're wearing our mask, washing our hands, using hand sanitizer, uh, and socially distancing. And it's not so much an infringement on your freedoms uh, as it is a courtesy to those people who may be more susceptible uh, to COVID-19. Uh, as we have learned, uh, sometimes people who are asymptomatic uh, are the most contagious. We know for a fact that people two to three days before symptoms are actually the most contagious. So please, just do the right thing. Make sure you are socially distancing, uh, taking care of yourself for those around you and for your family. All right. So let's get to the meat of today. So a couple of things I want to bring up. Um, first, we've been getting a lot of responses uh, through email and through uh, LinkedIn, asking questions about certain topics or uh, certain kinds of technology, uh, certain things that people want to learn more about. And I love that we're getting that feedback. Please keep it coming. We want to hear uh, from you. In response to that, we've developed two segments that we'll be doing on a regular basis. Not every time, mind you, but we'll do them on a regular basis. The first is the question of the week, uh, where we will take a question uh, and pose it to our guest. Uh, or if we don't have a guest that week, well, uh, I'll try to give the best response that I can. Uh, and uh, we hope that we are able to give information not only to the person who's asking the question, but also to the rest of you that you are able to find uh, valuable. The second uh, feature will be called the spotlight. And this is going to be an opportunity for us to talk about specific technology, uh, specific trends in the industry, maybe to spotlight a company that's doing something innovative uh, in talent, uh, or maybe they are hiring right now in the middle of a pandemic for talent acquisition people, and specifically for those of you who've been displaced uh, due, to, uh, due to COVID. We hope you find these things beneficial. Uh, in fact, today we're going we're gonna to have one of those here on the show. But before we get going with that, I want to remind you that you can connect with the show on Facebook, on Twitter, and on Instagram. The show is available on Spotify, on Buzzsprout, and on SoundCloud, and there is a video version, which some of you are watching right now, 
on YouTube. All you need to do is go to any one of those platforms, search Talent Unfiltered, and you will find us. You can also email the show if you like at showinfo at talentunfiltered.com. Remember, keep the questions and topics you'd like to see us discuss. Keep them coming. All the links to our social media and email and everything are in the description section uh, down below. And for goodness sakes, if you dig what we do, then like, subscribe, and share on your platform of choice. Don't forget to turn on the notification button so you don't miss any new content. Okay, let's get to it. So <clears throat> part of what I love to do uh, in my job is that I get to help companies, uh, recruiters and recruiting leaders get better at what they do every day. Uh, we got a question this week from a young lady named Nichelle. Nichelle is a senior recruiter who has a team of three that reports to her up in Boston. And she writes in and says, I find that my team and myself often get low response rates from our passive recruiting outreach. We do our very best to customize our messaging and add personal touches to our efforts, but our response rates remain stagnant or in many cases are declining on certain platforms. What would you recommend that we do to improve our outcomes? First of all, Michelle, thank you for the question. Uh, I hear this a lot. I think anybody who's in my uh, uh, industry does. Uh, all companies are grappling with this. How do we get people to engage with us? And we spend, they spend tons of money uh, in an effort to do just that. Um, I wrote an article talking about this a couple of months ago. And in there, my basic conclusion was that um, it's the recruiter's fault for not having better engagement rates. And before your head explodes, let me explain what I mean, okay? Companies spend tons and tons of money on a lot of different things. <clears throat> uh, they spend money on technology, whether that is AI or automation for scheduling, uh, or perhaps a new ATS. They spend massive amounts of time and money on creating a brand that they think is going to be interesting to uh, candidates that are out there. Everybody's worried about their glass door rating, right? Uh, they focus on creating a great candidate experience, a great employee experience. Uh, and so many of them now are investing real time and real money in recruitment marketing programs designed to drive eyeballs to your landing page or a careers page, right? You with me? Okay, good. So even with all of that, prior to COVID, companies still struggled with recruiting passive candidates. They had significant problems, companies of every size. Even home, well-known brands had trouble doing this, okay? And that, to me, is the problem that we're trying to solve for. How do we change what happens? You can have the best glass door rating in the world, but if you can't convert those people, if you can't get people to really jump in and be a part of your organization, then all of that money and all of that effort is for naught. Okay, we've established that recruiting passive candidates is challenging, and I think most companies find it to be that. However, there is one group out there that makes its living by recruiting passive candidates, and that's third-party agency recruiters. These people live, sleep, and eat passive candidates. That's where their bread and butter is. And so many people think they get paid or compensated for making a placement, which in some essence, technically they do. How they really get, how they really get compensated is by building relationships that make that placement possible. And I think that there are lessons that we can take and use in our internal recruiting efforts. So here's the example. You get a tough wreck. Manager comes to you, says, we've got this job. Manager's hair's on fire. We got to get some traction. What do you do? You go out, you post it on LinkedIn or Dice or wherever. You scour your ATS for silver medal candidates that weren't a fit two months ago, but now magically might be, which is very rarely the case. Then you go out and you send message after message after message on LinkedIn or whatever other platform. Hey, I've got this job. Hey, I've got this job. Hey, I've got this job. And you either get very little or not the traction that you were looking for. And what ends up happening is someone in the chain of command says, let's go ahead and put it out to an agency. You put it out to an agency. A few days later, your representative calls and goes, we've got the guy, right? That person ends up getting interviewed. Once they get interviewed, team loves them. All of a sudden, now there's a twenty, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar fee that's due that agency for what looks like a few days worth of work, which is completely inaccurate. And it gens up so much animosity about these guys are getting paid to do nothing, and it creates this environment where people don't like or don't trust agencies, which is completely wrong. What almost never gets talked about is the amount of time, effort, and money that the recruiter and the people who own the agency put into developing relationships to that make that placement possible. And these are the kinds of things that I think we can all learn, learn from. Now, I started as an agency recruiter. I can tell you point blank, 
that when I went to corporate, when I went internal, that experience made me much more effective than my cohorts internally because I viewed and thought about recruiting in a different way than the people who had come up through more traditional channels, okay? The question becomes, how do you do that, right? How do you do that? Because it's different. I've got political stuff over here. I've got to be this. I don't have the red tape on the agency side. There are things that agency people don't understand about uh, the internal mechanism, about how decisions actually get made. We all know that. But it's much easier than you think it is. First, you need to understand that the way an agency actually makes money, what they're really, really good at is being a, an, ex, an external recruitment marketing firm. That's what they do. They are paid to have relationships with people that they don't necessarily know they're going to place today, tomorrow, or next week. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to take away. First of all, agencies can be a very viable piece of what you try to do until you build that competency internally. Stop thinking that they're being paid too much money. They're not. The amount of effort, the amount of investment that goes into creating an opportunity and creating the environment for you to make a placement off of that takes a lot of money, time, and effort. Um, I do think, as I said, that model will ultimately go away as companies begin to get better at replicating that, uh, uh, that competency in their own organizations. Secondly, you need to understand what agencies either purposefully or inadvertently understand, and that is how to use recruitment marketing techniques to improve the quality of your interactions with candidates. All right, so let's talk a little bit about recruitment marketing and how you can use this to your advantage uh, when you are out there recruiting or how you're helping your recruiters build better messaging campaigns. So recruitment marketing and digital marketing are very, very similar. Uh, one is a funnel, they're both funnels, but one is a funnel that moves people through a process about a uh, product uh, or service. And at the end of that, the goal is to have them want that product or service. On the recruiting side, uh, it is a funnel that is designed to move uh, candidates through a three-stage distinct process. Uh, awareness, engagement, and conversion, meaning I want to make them aware of my company, and ultimately I want them to convert to a candidate, a full-blown candidate, or in best case scenario, I want them to be a future team member, okay? Now, this is important because it, it, it guides how you think about messaging. It guides the type of messaging. One of the things they talk about in recruitment and in digital marketing is to have the right message at the right time in the right place. Meaning you have to know what it is they're interested in, when they're going to be interested in it, and where you need to deliver that message to them. So <clears throat> some ATSs help you get through part of that process. They either have built-in or bolt-on functionality that allows you to build drip marketing campaigns. And these are really, really valuable because you can go in and you can build your campaign, set it, forget it, uh, and continue on other tasks that as an internal recruiter, you have to handle each and every day, whether that's setting up an interview day or, or whatever the case may be. A couple of things you need to make keep in mind. One, um, the campaign is only as good as the message. If the messaging is wrong or it's not timely or it's not in the right sequence, it won't make any difference. Secondly, it does nothing to help you passively source candidates. It only works for those things that reside in your system of record or your ATS. So if you're trying to passively recruit somebody from LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, I know somebody who recruited a candidate from Airbnb, which just proves that if the message is right, you can get people to engage. An example of this would be, let's say you're walking down the street and somebody you don't know walks up to you and goes, hey, Tim, Tom, Bill, Frank, whatever your name is, Michelle, I have this great job and I want you to take it. And here's what it is. Here's all the cool things about it. Why don't you take it? Why don't you take it? Why don't you take it? Well, no one is going to do that. People are going to be like, I don't know you. I don't know the company. Why are you talking to me? This is the exact same reactions that a candidate has when you cold message them about an opportunity. Inadvertently, this is what I meant when I said earlier, it's your fault. Inadvertently, you are putting people off by the type of message you are putting out, where you're putting it out, and when you're putting it out, okay? You need to spend time developing um, relationships with candidates that change the tone of the conversation. This is what agencies do so well. And inadvertently or purposefully, they use recruitment marketing techniques to do this. So now, before we wrap up for the day, I'm going to give you four things that I want you to try that I think if you do them daily, doesn't have to be hours, it can be 15 or 20 minutes each on each thing, 
But if you do them daily, the benefits to you long-term will be substantial. First, set time aside each day to increase the size of your network and the relationships inside those networks on the platforms where you recruit. So if you recruit on Twitter, build your following, build the people that you're connected with. If you do it on LinkedIn, do the same thing there. There are tools out there that will help you to automate some of this. There are tools that do it on LinkedIn. Um, couple caveats. First, be smart about it. You don't want to violate terms of service. And more importantly, you don't want to hit people with spam. Nobody, nobody wants to get a message that has no value to them at all. People just don't have the time uh, for that anymore. Also, uh, you want to make sure that when you do this, you do it in a thoughtful way. I personally always try to expand my network on LinkedIn as an example, but I never go below a second connection. Why? Because if nothing else, we have one person in common that we can both look at and go, oh, we're kind of in the same group. I'll go ahead and connect with you. And I know that's how I typically connect. I look and see, okay, who are we connected to before I actually accept, even though I'd like to think of myself as, a, as an open networker. Second thing I'd like you to do is set aside some time every day to passively source candidates that you have zero jobs for right now. Example, let's say your company uses Salesforce and you need Salesforce developers, but you don't have any openings right now. Wouldn't you want to know every Salesforce developer that you can get your hands on? Wouldn't you want to know everybody in that space to understand not only what's important to them, but also have real relationships that aren't based on anything other than I want to get to know you. That is real. That is genuine. That is transparent. It's not, I'm giving you something and I need something from you. I just want to know who you are. And if I ever have an opportunity, I'll tell you about it. And if I don't, that's cool too. If you don't want to hear about it, that's fine. Okay. Third thing I want you to do, spend some time on your messaging. Don't just write a job uh, uh, related message on LinkedIn or in an email. Take some time and think about the funnel, awareness, engagement, conversion. As I'm sourcing these candidates and I, as I'm talking to these new people that I've never talked to before, I have to think about where they are in the process and I have to build messaging around that. So on people that I'm just talking to, it's awareness. Hey, here's what I do. What do you do? right? On people that I've talked to for a while, hey, what do you think about this particular piece of information about our industry? And on those people that, I've had, that I have a relationship with, hey, man, I just got this job. I don't know if you're going to be interested. You're probably not, but I thought I'd throw it out there to you anyway. If you're interested, let me know. There's no pressure involved in that. It's just making people aware and sharing information. But that requires that you deliberately choose when, where, and how you're going to deliver messages. The last thing that I would ask you to do is to share information on your social platforms that matters, right? Not cat pictures, not stuff like that. I get it. But if you have a professional, if you have a personal space and you want to do that, do whatever, right? You want to take pictures of your food. But there is a time and a place for that. There should also be a professional presence to your social media, okay? Doesn't mean it has to be drab. Doesn't mean it has to be stiff or not fun. But you do have to think about what you're doing. So, for example, share things about your industry. Hey, I just saw this in my industry, and this regulation is going to change how we're going to do business. What do you guys think about that? And throw it out to your network. Share things about your company that are cool, things that you guys do that other companies don't do, or maybe you just started doing, with no thought that anybody's going to go, oh, I want to work right there. You're just sharing the information for the sake of sharing the information. At least that's how it's going to appear, right? Next, you only want to go after people in your network. I get it. We're all going to do passive recruiting. There's going to be an element of talking to people, of getting messages out to people about jobs. Just because of the nature of the job, there's going to be an element of that. But you should be building your networks and doing things so that you are offering jobs and offering job information to people that you already have some sense might be interested in. It. Okay? It's hard to do. Please understand, this is all about establishing yourself as something more than just a recruiter. It is about becoming a trusted advisor, a career consultant to people in the market who know that when they come to you, you're going to tell them the truth. Whether it's about your own company, hey, we're not the right fit for you for this reason, or you're an agency recruiter, hey man, I'm just telling you, this is a better deal because here's the stack that they work in, or here's the type of benefits program that I know matters to your family right? These are the kinds of things that build trusted relationships with the candidates that you're trying to recruit. What I will tell you is that none of this is going to happen overnight. It's not going to be easy. It will take time. 
But if you dedicate yourself, if you're in talent for the long haul and you do this every day and you devote an hour or an hour and 20 minutes every day to doing these three or four things, preferably all four, uh, you will find that the benefits in three months and six months and 12 months are just more than you had thought they would be. And they will be huge for you, uh, for the teams that you lead and for your company and your personal brand. So that's it for today. I hope that you found this to be uh, enjoyable and informative. I'd love to hear your feedback. If you think I'm full of baloney, please feel free to tell me in the comment section uh, down below. Now, if you like what we did here today and you want to stay up to date, then like, subscribe, and share on your platform of choice. You can also connect with me or the show on social media, and that's on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or you can just find me on LinkedIn. Join us next week for another episode of Talent Unfiltered. Until then, stay safe.